Welcome back, listeners, to Sandman Stories Presents. Today we have something a little special. Since the stories in this book are so short, I've decided to record several together from the book of Philippine folktales, collected by Mabel Cook Cole. This will be a two-parter, as there are a lot of short stories from the island of Mindanao, the second biggest island after Luzon. The following introductions give a bit of information on the spirits and gods that different indigenous groups in the Philippines hold sacred. Afterwards will be their stories, a lot of which will talk about their creation stories. There are a lot of people talked about in here, so I would advise you to click on the links when I put this up on the WordPress blog. Also, I took out some of the language that painted these various peoples as noble savages. Texts about people written by the turn of the century anthropologists tend to be full of judgment values like that. Okay, let's begin. Tribes of Mindanao. Introduction. About 1,000 miles to the south and east of Tinguyan and Igorot is the island of Mindanao, which is inhabited by mortals and immortals entirely unknown to the mountain tribes of the north. In the northern part of this great island are the Bukidnon, and their greatest concern is for the goodwill of the numerous spirits who watch over their every act. At times they gather a little hemp or coffee from the hillside or along the stream bank and carry it to the coast to exchange for the bright cloth which they make into gay clothes. In this country the belief prevails that there are spirits in the stones, in the baliti trees, in the vines, the cliffs, and even the caves. And never does a man start on a journey or make a clearing on the mountainside until he has at first besought these spirits not to be angry with him, but to favor him with prosperity and bring good crops. The greatest of these spirits is Diwata Magbabaya, who is so awe-inspiring that his name is never mentioned above a whisper. He lives in the sky in a house made of coins, and there are no windows in this building, for if men should look upon him, they would melt into water. Above the Gulf of Davao, in the southeastern part of this island, are a number of small tribes, each differing somewhat from the other in customs and beliefs. Of these, the most influential are the Bagobo, who dwell on the lower slopes of Mount Apo, the highest peak in the Philippines. They are very industrious, forging excellent knives, casting fine articles in brass, and weaving beautiful hemp cloth which they make into elaborate garments decorated with beads and shell discs. From a great fissure in the side of Mount Apo, clouds of sulfur fumes are constantly rising, and it is believed to be in this fissure that Mandarangan and his wife Darago live, evil beings who look after the fortunes of the warriors. These spirits are feared, and great care is taken to appease them with offerings. The following tales show something of the beliefs of these and the neighboring tribes in Mindanao. So this story is how the moon and the stars came to be, and it's a Bukidnon tribal tale. One day in the times when the sky was close to the ground, a spinster went out to pound rice. Before she began her work, she took the beads off from around her neck and the comb from her hair and hung them on the sky, which at that time looked like a coral rock. Then she began working, and each time that she raised her pestle into the air, it struck the sky. For some time she pounded the rice, and then she raised the pestle so high that it struck the sky very hard. Immediately the sky began to rise, and it went up so far that she lost her ornaments. Never did they come down, for the comb became the moon and the beads are the stars that are scattered about. Story number two, the flood story, also from the Bukidnon. A long time ago there was a very big crab which crawled into the sea, and when he went in he crowded the water out so that it all ran over the earth and covered all the land. Now about one moon before this happened, a wise man had told the people that they must build a large raft. They did as he commanded and cut many large trees, until they had enough to make three layers. These they bound tightly together, and when it was done, they fastened the raft with a long rattan cord to a big pole in the earth. 
Soon after this, the floods came. White water poured out of the hills, and the sea rose and covered even the highest mountains. The people and animals on the raft were safe, but all the others drowned. When the waters went down and the raft was again on the ground, it was near their old home, for the rattan cord had held. But these were the only people left on the whole earth. And now for the story of Magbangal. Magbangal was a good hunter, and he often went to a certain hill where he killed wild pigs for food. One night, as it was nearing the planting season, he sat in his house thinking, and after a long time he called to his wife. She came to him and he said, Tomorrow I shall go to the hill and clear the land for our planting, but I wish you to stay here. Oh, let me go with you, begged his wife, for you have no other companion. No, said Magbangal, I wish to go alone, and you must stay at home. So finally his wife agreed, and in the morning she rose early to prepare food for him. When the rice was cooked and the fish was ready, she called him to come and eat, but he said, No, I do not want to eat now, but I will return this afternoon, and you must have it ready for me. Then he gathered up his ten hatchets and bolos, a sharpening stone, and a bamboo tube for water, and started for the hill. Upon reaching his land, he cut some small trees to make a bench. When it was finished, he sat down on it and said to the bolos, You bolos must sharpen yourselves on the stone. And the bolos went to the stone and were sharpened. Then to the hatchets he said, You hatchets must be sharpened, and they also sharpened themselves. When all were ready, he said, Now all you bolos cut all the small brush under the trees, and you hatchets must cut the large trees. So the bolos and the hatchets went to work, and from his place on the bench, Magbanal could see the land being cleared. Magbanal's wife was at work in their house, weaving a skirt. But when she heard the trees continually falling, she stopped to listen and thought to herself, My husband must have found many people to help him clear our land. When he left here, he was alone. But surely he cannot cut down the trees so fast. I will see who is helping him. She left the house and walked rapidly toward the field. But as she drew nearer, she proceeded more slowly and finally stopped behind a tree. From her hiding place, she could see her husband asleep on the bench. And she could also see that the bolos and hatchets were cutting the trees with no hands to guide them. Oh, she said, Magbanal is very powerful. Never before have I seen bolos and hatchets working without hands, and he never told me of his power. Suddenly she saw her husband jump up, and seizing a bolo, he cut off one of his own arms. He awoke and sat up and said, Someone must be looking at me, for one of my arms is cut off. When he saw his wife, he knew that she was the cause of him losing his arm, and as they went home together, he exclaimed, Now I am going away. It is better for me to go to the sky, where I can give the sign to the people when it is time to plant, and you must go to the water and become a fish. Soon after he went to the sky and became the constellation Magbagna. And ever since, when the people see these stars appear in the sky, they know that it is time to plant their rice. And another story, how children became monkeys. One day a mother took her two children with her when she went to color cloth. Not far from her home was a mud hole where the carabao liked to wallow, and to this hole she carried her cloth, some dye pots, and two shell spoons. After she had put the cloth in the mud to let it take up the dark color, she built a fire and put over it a pot containing water and the leaves used for dyeing. Then she sat down to wait for the water to boil while the children played nearby. By and by when she went to stir the leaves with a shell spoon, some of the water splashed up and burned her hand so that she jumped and cried out. This amused the children, and their laughter changed them into monkeys, and the spoons became their tails. The nails of the monkeys are still black, because while they were children, they had helped their mother dye the cloth. And here's another story. Bulanawan and Aguio. Langona and his wife had two twin boys, 
named Bulanawan and Aguio. One day when they were about two years old, the mother took Bulanawan to the field with her when she went to pick cotton. She spread the fiber she had gathered the day before on the ground to dry near the child, and while she was getting more, a great wind suddenly arose which wound the cotton around the baby and carried him away. Far away to a distant land the wind took Bulanawan, and in that place he grew up. When he was a man he became a great warrior. One day, while Balanawan and his wife were walking along the seashore, they sat down to rest on a large flat rock, and Balanawan fell asleep. Now Aguio, the twin brother of Balanawan, had become a great warrior also, and he went on a journey to this distant land, not knowing that his brother was there. It happened that he was walking along the seashore in his war dress on this same day, and when he saw the woman sitting on the large flat rock, he thought her very beautiful, and he determined to steal her. As he drew near, he asked her to give him some of her husband's betel nut to chew, and when she refused, he went forward to fight her husband, not knowing they were brothers. As soon as his wife awakened him, Balanawan sprang up, seized her, and put her in the cuff of his sleeve, and came forth ready to fight. Aguio grew very angry at this, and they fought until their weapons were broken and the earth trembled. Now the two brothers of the rivals felt the earth tremble, although they were very far away, and each feared that his brother was in trouble. One was in the mountains, and he started at once for the sea. The other was in a far land, but he set out in a boat for the scene of the trouble. They arrived at the same time at the place of the battle, and they immediately joined in it. Then the trembling of the earth increased so much that Langona, the father of Aguio and Bulanoan, sought out the spot and tried to make peace. But he only seemed to make matters worse, and they all began fighting him. So great did the disturbance become that the earth was in danger of falling to pieces. Then it was that the father of Langona came and settled the trouble, and when all were at peace again, they discovered that Aguio and Bulanawan were brothers and the grandsons of the peacemaker. Alright, and now we're moving on to the Bagobo people from Mindanao, and this is their origin story. In the beginning there lived one man and one woman, Toglai and Toglibon. Their first children were a boy and a girl. When they were old enough, the boy and the girl went far away across the waters, seeking a good place to live in. Nothing more was heard of them until their children, the Spaniards and Americans, came back. After the first boy and girl left, the other children were born to the couple, but they all remained at Sibolan on Mount Apo with their parents until Toglai and Toglibon died and became spirits. Soon after that, there came a great drought which lasted for three years. All the waters dried up so that there were no rivers and no plants could live. Surely, said the people, Manama is punishing us and we must go elsewhere to find food and a place to dwell in. So they started out. Two went in the direction of the sunset, carrying with them the stones from the Sibolan River. After a long journey, they reached a place where were broad fields of Kongon grass and an abundance of water, and there they made their home. Their children still live in that place and are called the Magindanao because of the stones which the couple carried when they left Sibolan. Two children of Toglai and Toglibon went to the south, seeking a home, and they carried with them women's baskets, Baran. When they found a good spot, they settled down. Their descendants, still dwelling at that place, are called Baran or Bilan because of the women's baskets. So two by two the children of the first couple left the land of their birth. In the place where each settled, a new people developed. And thus it came about that all the tribes in the world received their names from the things that the people carried out of Sibolan, or from the places where they settled. All the children left Mount Apo save two, a boy and a girl, whom hunger and thirst had made too weak to travel. One day, when they were about to die, the boy crawled out to the field to see if there was one living thing, and to his surprise he found a stalk of sugarcane growing lustily. He eagerly cut it, and enough water came out to refresh him and his sister until the rains came. Because of this, their children are called Bagabo. 
End of part one. I love the children turning into monkeys. The playfulness is very apt for young kids. All of these stories are so interesting that I'm having a hard time stopping now. But I can't keep going forever, otherwise this podcast would be 10 hours long. The podcast shout-out is to Black Girl Soul. This one hits home a bit because, as some of you know, I've lived in South Korea for almost 15 years. Song Rae and Something Else are big fans of Korean dramas. I love hearing their passion, and I get to enjoy the dramas without having to watch them. And if you like it as much as I do, go and give them a 5-star rating on Podchaser or iTunes. And my listener shout-out is to Gyeonggi-do, South Korea, where I've lived since early 2013. Thank you, and good night.